Welcome back, everyone. Um, this morning, we are uh, happy to have Yishai Mansour uh, from Tel Aviv University. He's made fundamental contributions to bandits and reinforcement learning uh, and online learning. And I uh, can't wait to see what he's got in store for us today. <laughs> Take it away. OK, thank you very much. OK, so I guess the title of the talk is in line <laughs> with the title of this workshop. I'm going to talk about linear quadratic uh, control and online learning. I try to keep it at a high level and basically try to give the ideas of two joint papers with uh, Alon Cohen, Avinatan Hasidim, Tomer Koren, Nevan Lazik, and Kunal Tewari. Okay, so what is online learning? I think online learning is one of the successes in machine learning and especially on, on the theory side. We have both the bandit and the full information setting. And the original motivation is sort of coming in order to, to sort of, from the health domain, to select between different uh, procedures to, to give. But over the years, it had many applications, especially in internet advertisement and in internet sales. So this is sort of one well-established domain, which I think we understand fairly well today, both from the theory and the practice side. Reinforcement learning, I guess, is the topic of this workshop. It has many ap applications and many applications and many more applications that we will really like it to have. Sort of the success stories are coming mainly from games, but we would like to see reinforcement learning applied in other places like autonomous driving, robotics, etc. So the intersection of, of reinforcement learning and, and online learning is sort of not empty. There are sort of very obvious candidates to put there. Online MDPs is the one setting in which the, the costs are changing arbitrarily, similarly to adversarial online learning, but you are in an MDP setting. A different setting is UCRL, which is like an upper confidence bound for reinforcement learning, much in the style of stochastic uh, bandits. So I guess the third thing that, that I would like to add today is the linear dynamics, or the LQQR. And we'd like to sort of to combine both ideas from reinforcement learning and online learning and apply them to, to the linear dynamics setting. Okay. So, okay, so I'm going to go slowly, I warned you, sort of what is control in general. So in general, we have an agent it does an action so that we're going to sort of mark the, the actions by UT. It goes to the environment. And then we observe two things. We observe the next state and the cost. This is a general reinforcement learning picture. But when we are speaking about the linear dynamics, really what we mean is that the action space is a vector, is a k-dimensional vector. The linear dynamics really implies that there are two matrices, A and B, such that A times X plus B times U plus some Gaussian noise is the next state. So this is the linear dynamic part. And we have a cost. The cost is quadratic. So we have two uh, positive definite matrices, Q and R. And the cost is X, Q, x transpose qx plus u transpose ru. Just to make life easier, if, if you want to, want to think about the cost now, think of it as some kind of norm of x squared plus norm of u squared. OK? So at a high level, when I, th OK, coming from reinforcement learning, when I see this picture, there is two, two obvious things that, that was done here, right? A very explicit dynamic and cost was put on the table. This is the simplifying part. On the other hand, it's sort of a continuous domain, both continuous action and continuous uh, state space. OK. So linear control has many applications. Probably some of you know it uh, b better than me. In, in Google, sort of the original motivation that we looked at the problem was uh, climate control in, in data centers in order to save both energy and to get a better control schemes. But it sort of 
has been applied in robotic, finance, and in many other places. Okay, so, so let me sort of, just to make sure that everyone on the same page, although Ben did a nice introduction of the model yesterday, let me sort of re-say a few things that I think most of you are familiar with. Okay, so what is a policy? So a policy would be a mapping from states to action. So in this case, it's going to be a mapping from a d-dimensional vector space to a k-dimensional vector space. We'll be interested both in the finite horizon and infinite horizon. So in the finite horizon, we are looking at the sum of the cost for t time steps. And in the infinite horizon, we'll be looking at the average cost, assuming this limit exists, and it normally would exist under very mild condition. When we're looking at the infinite horizon, this is probably the more intuitive way of thinking about those systems. It's like a steady state of the system. Then I guess it shouldn't be surprised that since the dynamics are linear and the cost is quadratic, then the optimal policy is also linear. So what does it mean? It means that there exists a matrix K such that the optimal policy is, is K times X. Okay, and there is, of course, okay, some notion that we need to get into, but not too much. Okay, so those systems might be stable or instable. So what is a stable system? Stable system, if you take the matrix K, right, this is sort of your, your, your policy, and you look at how A plus BK is changing, you, you look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, you like all the eigenvalues to be less than one. The way to think about it is that sort of A plus BK is the way that you're going to modify the previous state to the next state. If the eigenvalues are less than one, then things would con hopefully converge. If they are more than one, it's in some sense hopeless because it means that they will diverge. <coughs> so, so this is a property of a matrix K, but it's stable. And if it's stable, it also, okay, it's well known, it induces a steady state distribution, a stationary covariance matrix. In a sense, what will happen is that if you look at the covariance matrices that it will generate over time, they will have a limit, and the limit is sort of going to be the covariance matrix K. Okay. A very brief introduction to LQR. So now let's try to look at it from the eye, from the lens of machine learning. So when, you see, when I see such a model, like there is two obvious places to think, okay, what would happen if things would behave differently? One is costs, right? Sort of, when I define things, I said, okay, the costs are quadratic and known. What happens if the costs change over time, right? So in many applications, it's natural to assume that the costs change over time, either abruptly or, uh, or drifting. So what we will be, also, so one paper that I'm going to describe will be looking at the case when the costs are changing over t time in an adversarial way. Adversarial, would, uh, we will still keep the, the matrices to be positive semi-definite, but they will be coming in arbitrary order, sort of, we'll have no idea what is the next sort of set of costs that we are going to get, yes? Just so I understand the notion of time here, so am I thinking that uh, it is the finite, steps. okay, so time steps, not project trees. Yeah. Yeah, time, time steps. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because Online learning. Finite right. Right. No, no. Okay. I was able to compute. Right. <laughs> Online, I, I'm an online <laughs> learning guy. <laughs> So when you have uncertainty, think online learning. Yes, you are, you, thank you, for, Alec, for the question. Yeah, so, so, so in both cases, I would, I'm thinking about a, a large T-step horizon, large because I want to ignore constant and small size effects. Right. The other interesting case is sort of what happens when you have uncertainty in the dynamics, sort of unknown dynamics. Basically, you don't know the matrices A and B. And uh, we look at the realizable cases. There is a set of matrices A and B describing the dynamics, and this is a recent work from the last ICML. Okay, and 
There are also other works in this domain, and when I sort of get, get to, uh, to describe it, I go in into more detail about the previous works. Sort of, but, but this is sort of the high level of the talk, right? So the main thing that I'm going to, to look at is regret. So regret would be the difference between how much is my algorithm paying in expectation over a T horizon versus what would an optimal algorithm. And now, now we'll need sort of to discuss what do I mean here by optimal. So what I would really like to compare my, my, myself to is the true optimal. But what we really do is compare ourselves to the best uh, single matrix which needs to be sort of also strongly stable. I will need to define it later. So the comparison is sort of how well is our algorithm doing, and we are comparing it in some sense to what the infinite horizon would do by, by selecting a single matrix and running with it. In both cases, sort of our aim is to get a low regret, vanishing over time. And in both cases, we are, we are showing a square root T regret bound, both for the, the changing cost and for the unknown dynamic case. OK. And I think it's a very interesting question. Why did we discover, we as the machine learning community, discover LQR only in the last two years? I have to admit that Chaba was before everyone else. Knowing the future he started in, in 2011. But, but there seems to be a surge of works on, on LQR in various other aspects of machine learning. Many of them also have to do with learning parameters of the system, stability, and other aspects. And, and I think it's fair to say that many of the works are sort of borrowing ideas for machine learning and trying to apply them in, in, in a sophisticated way on linear dynamic systems. And I think this is sort of one, of, for me, one of the challenges of this workshop is to understand the other viewpoint. People c coming more from control theory and learning how to this change. So for the rest of the talk, I'm sort of going to have two parts. One is going to talk about the changing cost, and one is going to talk about the unknown dynamics. So let's st start talking about the online linear quadratic control with changing costs. Isha. Yes. I mean, there, may I just suggest why? I mean, the, the first paper in 2017, I know why we wrote it. Which is, I mean, it, and it was just because at that point we had our big deep RL revolution. I was told okay. we could solve all robotics problems with deep reinforcement learning. And I wanted to know can you actually, what happens if you run it on LQR? What's the simplest problem? I see. That was why we, that's why we started looking at it. I see, because we solved all the other problems. Apparently, we got problem. <laughs> right. yeah. And this is what was left. Well, I, I, no, I, I think that the claims were pretty big, and I just want, and so we were really curious about like, what happens if you run out of something simple. So, okay. And that required us to actually try to figure out what, the, what a baseline was. It was cool that there's lots after that. Chat, where's Chat? Chat, where's it? Chat, why do you guys look at it? <laughs> Just a beautiful problem. Just yeah. nice. I think earlier than that, there was, there's, there was like a kind of a one off work by Feature who tried to do a pack analysis of LQR, yeah. and that was like in 1996. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. He did the EQ yeah. before Quinn's and Fichte. Yeah. Fichte. Uh, when, when I don't was, know where it is. <laughs> where, he's a, he, went, he went to industry and then yeah. disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but that was his PhD thesis. Laughing at us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, inter it's interesting. It comes in blips. Yeah, but like uh, that so was the same time as your so policy grading paper. <laughs> <That was okay. laughs> the feature. Yeah, but like I was doing this stuff for the whole time, like when I was uh, when he was a postdoc. But that wasn't that wasn't theory. Right? Not, I mean, Emma, Emma, no, he was doing like algorithms. Or algorithms. Or yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. He was in the Audrey, I leave. Okay. I tried to grab the attention <laughs> back to me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Although I love to hearing you. <laughs> OK, just to, to set up the problem sort of more specifically. I, right, so right now, think of a known dynamic. So you, you really know the, the matrices, which really, if you think about MDPs, you know the dynamics of the systems. And you have a changing cost. So in some sense, it very much reminds me, it should remind you of the online MDP stuff. 
like sham myself and Yale Vendar did it a long time ago. But, but this is sort of in an LQR setting. So the agent observes the states and selects an action. And again, what is the goal? So the goal is to minimize the regret, the cost that the agent observes, compared to the best single uh, policy. And the policy here is defined by, by a matrix. So what would be our basic sort of approach? And I think this is approach will reappear in the second work. And the, I think it sort of is shared by many other works as well. So, so of course, we have the original setting that we'd like to solve. But rather than solving it, what we usually do is it's much easier to think on a, on a different setting. Rather than thinking of what our action will impact the environment, we would like to think of an idealized setting in which we sort of switch from one steady state to another steady state. Sort of ignore the effects of time, ignore how much it takes to get to a steady state. Just think that sort of, as you are selecting a policy, you switch to a steady state. So now when we are switching from steady states to steady states, you're basically in an online setting because you're selecting an action. An action is called a policy. Here a policy is a matrix, who cares? But when you select it, you get something that I'm calling a steady state. Here it's going to be a covariance matrix. And it defines you a loss, right? So if you think about, if you have the steady state behavior of a policy, it really defines you a steady state loss. And the steady state loss or cost is really what the online learning really is, is about. Right? So now you can solve it as an online learning problem and optimize it. You need to be careful because the online learning is going to suggest something that you which is really telling you move from this covariance matrix to this covariance matrix, from this steady state to this steady state. You need to be sure that you can map it again to a policy. So the next step is sort of taking what the online learning is doing, mapping it back to a policy, and then the policy is really what's being run in the original setting. So, okay. So this is the, the picture that I want you to have in mind. And really what my talk is, is about is not about the specific result, but something that I think is more interesting than the specific results. It's more like an, a, a, an algorithmic methodology sort of on how to think about those problems in sort of an SDP formulation of the idealized setting. Okay, so, so let's look on, on this SDP problem. So capital sigma is going to be my covariance matrix. So this is sort of in the steady state. What is the covariance matrix of both states and actions? So, <coughs> So, my expect, so I can express my expected cost as an inner product between the cost matrices and my covariance matrix. And really, what, what do I want to do? When I take my covariance matrix, so it has like four parts, depending whether it's covariance of x, u, the action, or x and u. So really what I, I want is sort of have the stationary condition that given that sigma is, is the covariance matrix, what I'll get out is, is consistent with it, right? This is, and the third line, just ignore it. We need it for the, <laughs> we'll need it sort of in order to, to, to really guarantee both the computation and the, later when we look on, on the sets, right? But so essentially, right, what is the problem doing? It's looking at, this, at the covariance matrices in steady state. It has a feasibility condition. And, and it's trying to minimize overall. So, so notice this is minimizing all, overall positive semi-definite matrices sigma. This is why we need the trace condition, so that it wouldn't uh, run away. OK. And the most important thing is that the true sigma, like the true thing that you would have used if, if you knew everything, is always feasible here. Okay. Sorry, what do you mean by condition? Yeah. The last one? Yeah. It's more technical. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a sort of it. 
So when I'm solving things, I, I don't want things to, to be to blow up. But I'll need to get to it later. You, you, yeah, if you have a minimum, I can buy you. Like, are you setting you as a function of the time? Or what? I'll get to it later, but I don't. Let's put it on the side, OK? OK. So now, when I'm setting it this way, right? So, so, so now I can set it like in an online learning problem and doing an online uh, gradient descent. So, so essentially, right, my regret is, is now I'm getting the losses. So the losses is, is remember now, is this matrices composed from QT and RT, right? And we are assuming that they are bounded. In, so, 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 so we have our regret, and what we subtract from it is sort of the best sigma that you can find for, for all the sequence. So this is sort of comparing the best uh, single matrix to what we did in the online setting, right? So, Yusha, yes. Are you just calling the straight upper bound the strongly stable condition? Strongly so stable, I'll get to okay. find it. Okay. Yeah. OK. OK. So, so we need the, the S are bounded. The S is going to be the feasible SDP solution, and we will need the property that um, the matrices are changing slowly, right? And this is a property that online, online gradient descent will have, that, that essentially as we are updating things with gradients, the, our different solutions are not going to, to change widely, yes? No, um, so I'll get to it sort of slightly later, but, <coughs> but I'll be solving it for everything. So it's like in the online learning, sort of. You take, you take all the losses that you saw so far. You don't know the current one. So you're solving for the current one. You, you found the sigma t now. You're applying it. And then you, you get a new loss, right? So, so in the online learning, it's sort of the, the cycle is that you're selecting an action. In this case, it's the sigma t. And what you're getting back is the new laws, which are the new sort of qt and rt. And then for the next step, you're going to use them. At a time t plus 1, you use qt and rt and everything that we follow of it. OK. So the next step is sort of. We are solving all uh, now for, for covalence matrices. We need to be able to map them back into, mm -hmm. into a policy. So again, sort of, this is part of the technicalities that I didn't want to get into it. So, so essentially, our matrix sort of, it will take the covalence matrix. It will have the part which is sort of the covalence between the action and the state. And you, you get. The, the, the part which is the covalence between the states, and this will define the matrix K. So technically, what we also need is sort of to add some Gaussian noise in order for our proofs to go through. And, and the Gaussian noise sort of will be selected from a matrix, which is like an uncertainty matrix regarding this sigma that we solved. OK? So the important thing is when we choose our policy this way, it induces a steady state whose covalence matrix is sigma, right? And if sort of the Gaussian noise in the system is sort of not zero, the, f the feasible solution are going to be strongly stable. And, I <laughs> and the next slide will define the strong stability condition. OK. OK, so, so this is, right, we started in the original setting. We, de we set up an SDP program to solve. The SDP program solutions are used in the online linear optimization. We, can do, we did the gradient descent. You can do other things. And when you take the, this solution, you can define the policy. And you can run the policy for a single step. Right? So, so what is sort of what you should be aware is that you are solving for the idealized case, but you are running it for a single step every time. And this is why it's also important that the policies do not vary widely. Okay. The strong stability condition, 
and we'll have another one in the next slide. Okay, so a matrix it would be, we'll call it to be strongly stable if the following, so what, okay, so s stability, remember, is, is that all the eigenvectors are less than one. So, so this would be slightly more than, slightly or <laughs> slightly more than this. So, so when I'm looking at the matrix A plus BK, I want all the eigenvectors to be less than one. But what I really want to now is also that it will have a decomposition to an L and an H, and you can write as H, L, H to the minus one, where the eigenvalues of the Ls are bounded away from one, and the K and the H are, are bounded by, by some constant kappa. So now you can see when I'm taking this matrix and raising it to the power, right, sort of the dominant thing is, is going to be the, the fact that L has an eigenvalue less than one, because this is going to be raised to the power, and the kappa is going to be some constant which should be multiplied from the both sides. Side. Okay, so this is strong stability. We need something slightly more than strong stability, which we call sequential strong stability, because, because we are going to modify the matrices of, on the, on the, as, as time progresses. It's not the most elegant slide I would hope for, but essentially it's the same idea, right? We would like that the matrices that we generate are strongly stable. We can verify it. And now we, could, we need sort of to match the parameters of the different H's <laughs> that things would work out, okay? So what it would guarantee us, okay, this is probably, okay. All right, this is sort of what we would like it to, to guarantee us, right? We would like it that we are, when we are generating a sequence of these matrices, we would like them to be six and they are sequentially uh, <coughs> strongly stable, then, okay, assuming that they, they have the right steady state and the steady state do not change very much. If you remember when I sort of talked about the SDP, I said that the solution do not change very much. This is why I needed it. Now I can sort of bound the difference between the true thing and the observed thing. And this bound is sort of what I will use in order to analyze my regret. Yes, Chaba. What's X hat T? Is the, 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 the covariance matrix of uh, states in action. Under what? Under pi T. Pi, pi T is the policy that you chose at time T. Okay. So pi and T so is defined using KT. The difference between X hat T and X T is what? Oh, this is, so, okay. You're binding the difference in time t plus one compared to the right. difference in time t. I'm just wondering what the definitions of x t and x hat t, like how do they, like what's the difference between definitions such as, sorry. This is sort of. like your covariance matrix at time t with your notice. Condition on the current state. Condition on, Condition on the current policy, right? There's no state because you're imagining a steady state. Right. Like, in, okay, so, so, so remember sort of what you are doing here, which sounds sort of strange, is like all the time you are sort of imagining when you are choosing a policy, things will converge immediately to the steady state. Yeah, you will get a loss on the way. Basically, you want, you want to just say you're close to your asymptotic covariance matrix because you're mixing slowly. Okay. And, and at a very high level, sort of, here's how the, okay, what is the regret composed out of? Right. So the first thing is, is sort of it will be composed of the fact that what you think is the steady state and what is truly the steady state in the idealized setting is not identical. And the sequential strong stability needs to take care of it. The second thing is that you're doing an idealized regret, you have a regret. Even if you switch immediately to the steady state distribution, you still have a regret there. This would be the second thing. This is the online learning would take care of that. 
and the strong stability of the optimal policy sh should take care of the difference between sort of what, what is uh, the true covariance matrix of the optimal policy versus what you think is the, is the covariance matrix of the optimal policy. So when you plug it in, and I'm not going to do it, you, those three parts are sort of what composes the regret. Each one is, would be bounded by square root of t. Okay, so we are, we are almost done with the first part, but okay. Following our work, there was so sort of two improvements to our work. The first one by Algaval, Boulin, Hazan, Kaka, and Singh. And they were able to, to extend the work not only to quadratic uh, uh, forms, but to adversarial noise and uh, convex costs. And the second improvement, I think it's still in the working, getting a logarithmic regret. So we show a square root here, regret. They are getting a logarithmic regret for Gaussian noise and qu quadratic costs. <laughs> Sham is, uh, okay, I didn't see the paper, <laughs> I, but I do have an assurance from Elad. <laughs> we need stronger assumptions for that. I don't, I, I suspect yours can't be improvable. Uh, I, I don't know if you have like, much stronger assumptions. Okay. Okay, I, I completely trust you given that I didn't see the paper. <laughs> it's... Okay, go. So did you sort of state feedback or route feedback? State feedback. State feedback. Yeah, state feedback. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Okay, so I guess in the, okay, in the 10 minutes that I have, I want to talk about the other paper. But any questions? <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so, so the second work is sort of, I think it's reusing, oh, sorry. Uh, Nothing is simple. Routine, what's the dependence on sort of dimension? Uh, it's polynomial, but it's polynomial. Yeah, okay. it's polynomial. And, and why can't you just use uh, continuous multiplicative uh, weights as opposed to we use one gradient design, one follow the leader. You can use whatever you like there, right? It's, 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 it's like you have all the properties that you like in the online learning, right? Because things are changing slowly. You can, right? We, we do have another, so in the paper we have two implementations. Okay. Okay. So now I want to talk about the unknown dynamics part. And let's see how much. And, okay. Okay, so what is the problem? <laughs> Just to make sure that everyone is on the same page and I'm also on the same page. We don't know the matrices, but we do know the costs. I think this is sort of a classical problem of identification. The agent observes the states and selects an action. And again, our goal is to minimize the regret. Again, strong stability will play here a role. And the main result would be sort of a regret which is square root t and the polynomial in the dimension, and the main thing that's going to be computationally efficient. And this is sort of comparing it to the previous work. I think the first one was by Abbas and Chaba in 2011. They show that the regret really scales with square root of t, but they had an exponential dependency on, on the dimension, and they didn't have... That was an additive. It was additive? Okay, sorry. Still but, but it wasn't efficient, right? No. Okay. It's One out of two is not good. <laughs> <laughs> the paper was fine, but... Okay. So later, Ibrahimi and I'll improve the regret bound, but still it wasn't in, inefficient. Dean et al., which I'm going to mention later, showed like a T to the two-thirds explore-exploit algorithm, which was efficient. We show a square root T, Poly D algorithm, and I should mention that Mania et al. It's not their main result in the paper, but using their uh, results and their lemma, similar results could be de derived from their work also. Okay, so the main thing that I wanted is sort of to connect the two works and sort of resell you this basic idea that I worked so hard so far to sell you and show you that it really can be reapplied again also here. So if we go back to the SDP formulation, this is sort of what we have. This is the main thing. 
Now the main issue is that if we write this SDP formulation, of course, we are missing something. We don't know the A and we don't know the B. We don't know the dynamics. Okay, so the most obvious thing, and if we are going to do it, we'll plug into A our estimate of A, we plug into B our estimate of B. But this would change sort of what we really need to solve, right? Because now the A and B are, A hat and B hat are not the true dynamics anymore, right? So we will have, let's say, an approximation. Oh, this is the delta. And we will, and, and essentially we'll have a matrix V, I'll let you define, but assuming that the trace here is bounded, right? This is the new program that we would like to solve. Notice that we are putting, plugging in our estimated dynamics, but this is sort of like a correction term. And its main goal is to sort of to, to keep the set of, of solution to include with high probability the, the right solution, the optimal solution. So this is sort of enlarging the set of solution so that it will include the optimal solution. Okay, so, so again, sort of what we are going to do here is what many of the other works did is optimism in face of uncertainty. Either we'll observe a small cost, which is great, or we're, we're guaranteed to, to do some exploration. Okay, so let, let me start with sort of two basic ideas and then sort of try to explain our work and then I probably need to wrap up. Explore, explore. This was done in and in et al. 2018. Okay, you basically sort of use during the explore part some, basically you're sampling some Gaussian distribution. Now you have enough samples and then you can go and solve for for basically a regression, sort of you're finding A hat and B hat. So at least the first time that we saw that this was proposed to doing this in linear dynamics was in uh, 50 years ago. But I guess this is so obvious, it shouldn't be surprising. So you have the samples, given the samples, you can solve for the dynamics. Given a model, you solve for the model and now you execute it what you solve. So now when you separate the explore and the exploit, this is where you get the T to the two thirds trade-offs. Those in online learning, I'm sure, sort of feel comfortable with it. Now, when you're doing optimism in face of uncertainty, this is sort of the work in Abbasi and Chaba. So what you are doing is sort of, you're keeping a set of feasible solutions and which includes the true one. <clears throat> you're, you're solving for the policy that minimizes the cost over all the models in your feasibility set. Now you're executing this, right? So, so notice that when you're minimizing over this set, you're not really minimizing something real. You're just saying there are many models and this is the best model. If this is the model, then it's great. You execute this, you get back the feedback, you update now, given what you observe, you can update the version space. What are, are the feasible solution? And you reiterate. So essentially this, at a very high level, guarantees you a square root T regret. And, <clears throat> and what you are really guaranteeing that it's sort of every time that you are executing, what, what you think the solution was, the cost was, is less than what the optimal cost was. Because the optimal mode, the true model is always in the set and you're selecting the best model out of it. Okay. And the problem is that, the problem is, is not co convex in the policy parameters. This is why I said the solution was not efficient. So here's the intuition for our algorithm. Right. We are going to run sort of in phases. This is similar to what they did. Right. And when we, we are running in phases because when we switch from phase to phase, we do incur some cost. Right. So those are the phases. We are not going to have too many phases. Like with high probability, okay, we have, okay, we'll have, the number of epochs will be bounded by log t. And this should have 
And given that we'll have a warm start, that we sort of learn the parameters to some accuracy at the beginning, we can get a total regret, which is square root of t. And how much time do I have? Two minutes? <laughs> Ten? Ten? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone can give me more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so the basic algorithm, right? We are running at the beginning a warm start. Essentially, we are choosing um, actions randomly from some Gaussian distribution. And, and afterwards, we are running in epoch. In every epoch, we are sort of selecting a policy using our semi-definite program. We execute this po policy during the epoch. So every epoch has a single policy. And when we switch from one policy to another, this is where you lose the log t because you need to think to re-stabilize. And then epoch ends is when the sort of uncertain, when the determinant of the doubles, sort of when the uncertainty set sort of shrinks, essentially. So this guarantees you that the number of epochs is only logarithmic. And during every epoch, right, we are estimating the parameters from the past, right? sort of giving everything that we observed, we are sort of solving for the dynamics. And given the solution from the dynamics, we are solving our SDP. And this is sort of the main difference, right? By adding this additional thing to the constraint, this is becoming a, a positive semi-definite program that which you can solve. And this additional term is really what guarantees you that the true things would lie inside here. OK. I know it's very hard to digest, but let's keep it at this level. OK. I'm, I'm starting to, to wrap up, sort of. One issue that I think it's important to say, but it's sort of technical, <laughs> is that there is an issue when you, okay, when you think MDPs and you move to LQRs, there is this, an issue of boundness, which never comes up in MDPs. Because MDPs, the state step S is bounded. It's not a real issue. In LQR, you might have a small probability when, when you're trying to control the system that it will run away. Right? So essentially, you, you will, <coughs> you can have a small probability of getting very large value. Wait, what, what do you mean, Michelle? Okay. All right. What, what, is the, what, what do you mean by that? Okay, stable? You mean a, a stabilizing control? Yeah, right. Even if you run a stabilized control, you still have maybe an exponentially small probability. Or not. You can have a very high probability of having a very large value, right? I mean, the Even if you have a very small probability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, I guess I'm saying it's a non zero probability that, that you will get very high values. Yes. Right? And this might have an unpredictable effect on the expectation. So we were hoping that it will cancel out somehow, but sort of technically we weren't able to show it. But it's something which you sh we, we should be aware of. Right? Even if it's an exponentially small probability, when it blows up, it's exponentially large. And when you multiply those two exponentially, it's not clear that you're going to get something small. OK? So essentially, what our guarantee is, is a high probability guarantee. Right? We generate sequentially stable policy, and we keep the states bounded with high probability. Right? This is sort of the inside of our proof that I didn't show you. But really, our, what our proof says is with very high probability, all the states are bounded. And therefore, given that all the states are bounded until now, you can continue sort of by induction. And you're saying you can't do this just in so in the expectation, we weren't able to show it. Even with uh, this contraction? It's yeah, because even, even if you take. Because you're just working with the matrices and they're contracting, right. why can't you just do. Uh, because yeah. there is a tiny probability that we will diverge. The states can explode faster than the probability. Right. Okay. We, we, okay. okay. So, so, Sometimes it works, sometimes it, it doesn't, <laughs> but we won't be able to show either way. <laughs> because, because, okay, you have an exponentially small probability that it, that it will grow, but when it grows, it grows exponentially large. 
And, and now it's two exponents, and suddenly the constants so are important. Stable, so why is it growing at all? You always no, but you have noise. The Gaussian noise is sort of. You're very unlikely in the Gaussian noise, right? And, and very unlikely, it's, it's like an exponentially small probability. So the high probability result is your intuition, right? right? I don't expect the low, I expect that the Gaussian noise will behave nicely. We usually it translates to expectations. Somehow we won't able oh, to oh, get sorry. it. Right. This is because you're uh, looking at your somehow actual cost and not the expected yes. conditional cost. Yes. You look at the expected conditional cost. It should be no, but even in the expected, you have a tiny probability of having huge cost. Okay. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. I think the SDP representation sort of that I tried to sell you, I'm not sure how many bought it, I, I think it can have more applications because it, it's, it talks in a very intuitive way, at least for right now for me, sort of how can you model the system, you are modeling it using the steady state and you can later sort of transform this, this steady state into a, an arc, a, a, a step by step. OK? I guess it's sort of the dependency of the bounds on the dimension, although it's polynomial, it's not clear sort of what is the right dependency. I'm, not, I'm rather sure that I think we have like the power of 3, d, d, d cube. But I'm sure this is not sort of a, the right dependency. And sort of thinking of the very high level, I guess we would like to go beyond linear models. I have no idea what we can hope to do realistically efficiently when we go beyond linear models. And I guess I'm done here. <laughs>